Good afternoon, everyone. Please continue enjoying your lunch and dessert uh, as we begin the program. My name is Alvin Abraham. I am the Dean of the Doherty Family College here at the University of St. Thomas. Uh, as Dr. Sullivan mentioned, we just graduated our first class of Doherty Family College students, and we welcomed more than 150 new students a month ago. I am so proud of the fantastic work being done by our staff, faculty, and students, many of whom are here today, so if you have a chance, please connect with them uh, post the lunch to learn more about what's going on at the college. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Greg Cunningham, Senior Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer at US Bank. Greg has a BA degree in marketing from Clark Atlanta University and an MBA from Fordham University. He joined US Bank in 2015 as a Vice President of Customer Engagement, hoping to make diversity and inclusion a business imperative. In order to do this, he focuses on workplace culture, customer loyalty, supplier diversity, and community outreach. His diversity and inclusion expertise has been showcased in national and regional media outlets, such as Fortune and Bloomberg. His personal brand tagline reads, I bring life to brands, which Cunningham illustrates by offering vision, creativity, and relatab relatability to those he meets. Greg also, we're very lucky to have Greg uh, as a DFC advisory board member, and he's a key partner for our college. Please welcome Greg Cunningham. Thanks, Alvin. Thanks, Greg, for taking the time to be here. Thanks we really appreciate it. Um, we thought we'd switch things up uh, with the first first Friday of the year, and instead of having Greg up at the podium and uh, with the deck, uh, open it up to sort of a fireside chat conversation. In fact, it was Greg's idea. So uh, I'm excited to ask a few questions. Um, many of you also submitted questions as you were registering for the event, and so we'll ask a couple of those. But we'll open it up to the audience for questions as well. So be thinking uh, about questions that you might have for Greg, and we'd love to take a few of them uh, towards the end. Uh, to begin, Greg, I'd love for you to tell us about your path from Pittsburgh, which is where you grew up, to the role of Chief Diversity Officer at US Bank. Um, great, great opening question. And I do have to say um, thank you to Alvin and Dr. Sullivan for allowing me to mix up the format. Um, so that is my job, is to disrupt. And so um, I figured I'd get right to it. Um, but you know, your first question is probably the most important one because you know, there are probably three, I think, critical things that I wanna leave all of you with as we talk about workplace diversity. And the first one that's related to your question about where I'm from is I personally believe um, diversity is the um, it's the expression of your life experiences. It's how your life experiences show up in um, the decisions that you make, um, how you behave, and how you interact with people. Um, it's less about these um, reductive categories that we place on people um, that really, in many ways, sort of devalue the contributions that we make. And so my definition of diversity is to find um, by my life experience. And so to answer your question, I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I was born in a, a white side road housing project. My dad was a butcher. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm gonna give away my age here in a minute um, because in the spring of uh, 1968, my dad's a butcher shop owner. Um, as many of you know, that April, April 4th, 1968, Dr. King was assassinated in Memphis and my dad's butcher shop was looted and burned. And I remember my dad leaving and going to work every day um, and he wouldn't come home. And I would always ask you know, my mom why he never came home and what's he doing and I, I finally I asked him 
And sort of in his own way of sort of enrolling me in what was happening, he actually asked me to help him create this sign that we put in the window of the butcher shop. And the sign was owned by a soul brother. Mm. Um, so we're again, we're in the 60s. So we're still talking about soul brothers and soul sisters, right? So we did that. And, you know, shortly after that, um, I remember my mom. And so if any of you have been in a housing project, there were actually 80 families in the housing project where I grew up. And my dad came home from work one time and all of our stuff was in the front yard, if you could call it a yard, right? Mm -hmm. My mom was like, we're leaving. Like, we're moving out of here. It's crazy. And, you know, I, you know, we moved out of the housing project into a single family home apartment building. And in the interest of time, I'll fast forward to say my journey um, led me to my mom deciding to put me um, to emphasize education for me. And we made some different school choices for me than my siblings had. My mom put me in a private Catholic school in Pittsburgh. And I ended up going to a historically black college. Um, Dr. King, Clark Atlanta in the house. <laughs> Clark Atlanta, we in here. Um, but I went to an HBCU. I went to historically black college um, for undergrad. And all of those experiences um, have really shaped how I define diversity. And again, I think it's the most important point which is diversity, because I believe it's shaped by our life experiences and because our life experiences are ever evolving, it means you can evolve your skills around diversity and inclusion. And so I like to think of it um, in terms of this evolving learned experience that happens over time. And that's the perspective that I bring to the work that I do at US Bank. So I have the good fortune of knowing you a little bit more than most people in the room. And so I know that uh, a big chunk of your career is in marketing. Yeah. And then you shifted to d &I work. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about why the career shift mm -hmm. from marketing to d &I. Yeah, I spent most of my career, I, I spent 17 years of my career at Target um, um, in primarily all marketing jobs and considered myself now a reformed marketer um, <laughs> and <laughs> but more than a marketer I, I more so considered myself a storyteller and you know I never well it, I got to be completely honest when US Bank asked me to do this job I actually said no um, because I didn't have a background I wasn't um, a diversity practitioner um, I certainly didn't have any any experience in um, HR and to their credit, um, our CEO said to me, that's exactly why I want you to consider it. Um, because I think your experiences and your perspective um, and your ability to influence um, people and change behavior as a marketer, that's exactly what's needed in this space. Um, you know, uh, Dr. King has this um, saying, if you've read Dr. King's uh, letters from a Birmingham jail, um, he has this saying that, we are, um, we are brought together by this, this inescapable web of mutuality um, tied to a single destiny. And you can't be all that you ought to be until I am everything that I can be. And I can't be everything that I ought to be until you're everything that you ought to be. And I firmly believe that. And I think that's what most companies don't understand. And so this notion of being able to share um, a human experience that I learned in marketing, which is all about changing behavior and sort of mobilizing people around ideas. Okay. Um, I think in many ways that's what leadership is about. It's mobilizing people and resources around your ideas. And if you have that as a fundamental skill, um, I think that is essential to what this work is about because I, I really firmly believe that I, I try to meet people where they are. Um, I don't expect everybody to share my perspective on um, diversity or inclusion or what that means. But what I do expect is that we can um, appreciate each other's life experience um, and have a conversation and try to find um, some understanding around a common objective um, and move together across difference and never ignoring that it exists. But how do we move together um, despite difference? Um, and I didn't answer your question at all, but... Um, like a good marketer, right? This... I know how to spin really well. <laughs> but, but the real answer is, is you know, there were, 
there was, um, Alvin, when they asked me to take this job, I, I, when I came to the bank, I was in a marketing job mm. and was doing some, what, you know, was, was work that was really good and the bank was really um, pleased with it. And um, when they came to me, it was right around the time where there was a lot of news coverage of police shootings, of unarmed black men in the news. And, and our CEO at the time was Richard Davis and he was really struggling with you know, what should I be doing about it? What should we be doing as a company? What's our role in all of this? And, um, you know, help me think through it. And, and, you know, I think your perspective would be great in this job to help us understand what this means and what our role in it is. And what I said to him once I took the job was, I don't need you to do, like, we don't need to release, you no know, press releases. I don't need you to give speeches. What I need you to do is actually understand there's a different type of leadership that is required. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we need to focus on leading out loud, and that means for you being vulnerable. Um, I need for you to be brave in how you talk about race and gender and diversity and inclusion. Um, we need to set different expectations around what leadership means. Um, and leaders have that responsibility because leaders go first. Like, that's the definition of leaders. Leader, you took the risk first. That's why you're in the role of leadership. And so I need you to go first. And I need you to talk about, you know, your journey and um, all of that I learned, you know, as sort of developing a skill around marketing and um, how to change uh, behavior and perception. So I hope I came close to answering your question. It's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I will say that uh, my first week on the job here at St. Thomas, we had a meeting with um, leadership at uh, US Bank to talk about us coming on as a corporate sponsor and us uh, partnering together for interns. And you had, I think, at that point, been almost your first week in moving into this new space. Yeah. Um, and you've been a champion for our college since. So I'm glad uh, that that transition happened because we were able to connect and you were able to help support our work. So thank and, you. And, and let me just say, and I said this at the table before you asked your next question, but I. You know, it, it was an easy decision for me to, to support the college, and I was just saying this to Dr. Sullivan, that when, I, um, when you came and told us about the mission of DFC and the types of kids that you wanted to help, um, I, I saw myself, right? I saw, like, I was that kid. Like, I was that kid that was, you know, my grades were decent, but I wasn't killing it. Like, wasn't nobody checking for me, you know what I mean? Like. <laughs> Really, like I wasn't being recruited, wasn't nobody throwing scholarship money at me, you know. I wish I was, but I was not that, yeah. you know. And, but sometimes, you know, there, there's lots of programs and support for those kids that are getting the 3.5 and the 3.8s, and, and that, that's awesome. I think that's incredible. Um, but I really like grabbing that kid that's a 2.5, you know, that's got just as much potential, that just needs somebody to believe, that just needs somebody to give them an opportunity. Um, and, and so I saw myself in those kids and I couldn't not you know, jump in um, because I know, you know without somebody giving me an opportunity, I wouldn't be sitting here. I wouldn't yeah. be, like I couldn't even have dreamed of like, the, the stuff that I'm doing and working at a, having worked for now three Fortune 500 companies. And you know, it, it, it takes somebody to actually believe and see the potential in you. Um, that, that sometimes there's just that little spark. And that's what HBCUs do for mm -hmm. black kids in particular. Mm -hmm. You know, it's this notion of um, creating value mm -hmm. and you understanding your value. Um, I don't know if you guys, did. Um, many of you watched the Emmys a few weeks ago. Um, uh, I missed it. My wife happened to see it. She really loves award shows and does them. And, and I do too, so guilty pleasure. I like award shows too. But Michelle Williams gave the speech um, at the Emmys that was so powerful. And what she said, and I'm going to paraphrase it, but she said, what happens when you place value on an individual, what happens is, is they inherently place value in themselves. And guess what they do with that value? <laughs> They actually put it back into the business. They actually put it back into the work. And that's what happened for me. You know, is somebody placed value on me. That's what HBCUs did for me. And so I then inherently understood my own value. And so all the work that I do is just an expression of me understanding my own value, my own self-worth. And that's what we have to do for these young people, um, is allow them to have um, that inherent value so they can give it back to us. Um, and help us build vibrant communities that benefit all of us.
Thank you so much for jumping in with us. We appreciate it. Um, I'm going to shift gears, but it's still incredibly aligned. How do you go about building a diverse workforce, uh, and why is this a priority for U.S. Bank? We know and we hear um, from many of the business leaders in this room that we are struggling to find workers to fill positions that are available. Um, baby boomers are retiring in droves. We also know as the population of color is growing in our state, um, we have not done as a state the best job in making sure that even that population of, of folks is prepared and ready to enter into some of these uh, jobs. How, t talk to us a little bit about, about yeah. the work that U.S. Bank does here. Yeah, I'm, I'm really proud of the work that we're doing. It's not to um, at all suggest that we've got it figured out and we have as much work to do as anybody. Um, I will say that, you know, the fact that we can't find the talent um, is an excuse. And um, I don't accept that. Um, but the answer to your question, I, I, I think about it this way. Um, I see it in terms of um, mirrors and windows, right? I think what people want and what everybody wants is when you look at an organization, you want to see reflected in, you know, you want to see yourself reflected in that organization. You want to see your values reflected. You want to see people who look like you, have a similar experience that are in the organization and that they're thriving, right? Because that, in turn, gives you hope that I can do that too. If you don't see it, you don't believe it's possible. And to me, Windows is about, you know, having some sort of visibility to what's possible. So now I'm in the organization. Is it possible for me to continue to thrive and grow in this organization? Um, now, somebody's got to open the window for you so you can climb through it. Um, but I see it um, that way because what organizations want is they want you to come with um, a, a foundational element of, of technical ability and then to continue to have impact in the organization um, by mobilizing, as I said before, your ability to mobilize other people around your idea, to mobilize resources and people um, around your idea. And that's how, those are the people that get recognized and rewarded. Um, and so what we've done is we've actually made diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and equity is probably the second big point that is probably another session that we should have, but um, we've made it part of the leadership expectation. And so on everybody's performance review, um, you, there, are, there are seven core leadership behaviors that all of us have to demonstrate, and one of them is around managing inclusion, right? And so what gets measured gets done, and so if you don't have systems of accountability built around this, then it'll just continue to be a conversation and you'll never get to outcomes. Um, and so we've built in systems of accountability um, around both our performance expectation, around all of our hiring expectation, and we do all the stuff that is not earth shattering, but we, you know, we have um, mandatory diverse interview slates for candidates. We also have uh, mandatory diverse interview panels, so it's important who's actually interviewing people, um, that there are diverse um, leaders actually doing the interviews. And then we, we apply scorecards. So we have scorecards for the enterprise um, that our CEO and I uh, report to the board of directors twice a year um, on our results. Um, I meet with our CEO, Andy Ciceri, four times a year to give him his scorecard. And then every business line leader in our organization also has a diversity and inclusion scorecard. Um, so there's frameworks of accountability um, that ensure that everybody is doing it. And, you know, I think that's what's critical is there's got to be some consequence to not doing this. Not because it needs to be a punitive thing, but because this is how we're going to grow our business. Um, I was telling somebody this the other day, and it's a really short um, anecdote, but, you know, when you think about why this is important to your business, if you think about the sport of golf, um, you know, and golf is a good sport and, and people enjoy playing it and it was doing well before Tiger Woods. But, you know, when Tiger Woods came along, it like exploded the sport and it became like this phenomenon that every, it opened the door and more diverse people wanted to play. And same with women's tennis and the, and the Williams sisters. But there was a time when Tiger Woods couldn't even play on those courses. You know, there was a time we couldn't play at Augusta National because of his skin color. And imagine if they had never let Tiger Woods play golf. <laughs> like, we'd be sitting here like Phil Mickelson is like the second greatest golfer ever, you know? 
which is cool, but you miss Tiger Woods. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what I'm saying is, in your organization, we're missing a whole lot of Tiger Woods, y'all. Yeah. You know, there's a whole bunch of there's a whole bunch of people that aren't being given the opportunity um, to to shine. And I think most organizations hire to diversity and manage to assimilation. And that's the fundamental problem. Oh, they snapping up in yeah. here. We got a whole... <laughs> and they been snapping at St. Thomas before? <laughs> Is that a new thing happening? We're changing at St. Thomas, it's good. It's changing, uh, things are changing. So, I mean, what you're sharing is incredible and it's exciting. Uh, I imagine, though, in a, an organization the size uh, of U.S. Bank, that there are challenges that you've yeah. faced in your work. Um, what would you say are a couple of the biggest challenges uh, you've faced in this work uh, at U.S. Bank in regards to the DNI work that you're doing? I think getting people to understand um, the notion of equity, um, and equity is all about is all about power, and you know, I, I think helping um, people be much more brave and courageous in this conversation around equity. I mean, it's no secret, you know, I'm in an industry where, you know, a lot of the disparities that we talk about, whether it's economic disparities and particularly economic disparities, well, the financial services industry in a large way is largely responsible yeah. <laughs> for a lot of the disparities that we, we talk about. And so... You know, it's been really cool, though, to be able to work for an organization where we can have that conversation, that I have leaders in the organization, and we could talk about that really honestly and say, okay, now what do we do about it, and how can we be really brave and being part of that solution? And so I'm really grateful that I have leadership that has allowed me to, um, to step in this work in a really brave way um, and that they trust me enough to do it. But the biggest challenge, honestly, Alvin, is just having really honest conversations about equity and what that means. Mm -hmm. you, won't, you won't move the needle at all until you can have that conversation because now you're, you're starting to talk about what are the root causes for why women, people of color, aren't moving into senior level um, executive positions in these organizations, why companies for decades have been spending billions of dollars trying to figure out diversity and inclusion, you know, since the late 70s or whenever. Um, and you could argue that things are worse now than they were then, you know. And you've got to have um, conversations around uh, equity and, and what that means and, and, and this notion of power and who has it and who doesn't and who's willing to share it and who's not. And um, you got to get after it. Um, you shared some of those sort of larger picture um, areas that you've allowed people to sort of think about how they want to diversify their teams. Can you give us a little bit of insight into uh, some of the examples of things you're doing to build really diverse pipelines into your organization? Yeah, you know, a, it, it starts with everybody defaults to hiring mm -hmm. um, as the solution, and hiring is never like the silver bullet. Like, if you pay people enough money and you're a well-managed organization with, you know, solid financial performance, you can get enough diverse people. The issue is usually retention. You, the issue is usually with retention and promotion. You're always going to be more diverse in the organization at the lower rungs of the organization. Where you start to see headwinds is as you move up in the organization. And so, you know, what we've done is both created incentives and put systems of accountability in place We've started to think differently about our hiring practices and where we recruit, um, but we've also started to um, think about our methodology around measurement in terms of availability of talent. And so you've got to, the short answer just in the interest of time is you've got to, you've got to bake this notion of um, diversity, equity, and inclusion into all of your talent management practices. And that's everything from recruitment, that's your development education planning, it's how you do succession planning, um, that has to be an intentional part of your talent management processes. Um, it's the only way you can build the, um, build the pipeline. And then once you have the pipeline, though, um, you actually have to start pulling people through. And sometimes that means you've got to take chances on people. Um, we take chances on everybody else, um, but we're really hesitant to do that with women and people of color. It's really an odd thing to me. Um, 
you know, that there's sponsorship that happens mm -hmm. informally for folks and then it doesn't happen for other folks. And so we've, we've implemented sort of formal sponsorship um, um, with our most senior leaders and our women and people of color leaders. Um, but we have a very intentional succession and talent management process for, um, for diverse employees as well. Do you mind just defining sponsorship and what that means to you? Yeah, sponsorship is a much more, you know, we all mentor people, right? Like we all do the coffees once a month with the person and you talk about stuff and like you go away and then you sort of say, well, okay, well you set up the next coffee. You know, and it's like, okay, and we get back together and we talk about whatever we're gonna talk about. Um, sponsorship is just a much more active, um, sponsorship is me putting my personal capital um, on the line for you. When, you know, when the door is closed, I'm advocating for your development. Um, I'm ensuring with my peers that you're getting stretch assignments, um, that your name is being brought up when we sit in the room and we close the door and we talk about everybody. Like, who's advocating for Alvin, right? Um, that's sponsorship. It's you're, you're actually putting your personal um, and political capital on the line for these people. And so we've decided to formalize that um, within our organization. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so as demographics continue to shift in our state uh, and St. Thomas prepares the next generation of leaders, what is one thing you wish all college presidents and college professors were doing to prepare our future workforce? You know, it's hard for me to get to one thing or anything, but, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think, um, you know, as I said before, it's, it starts with you sharing your own vulnerability around this, you know, um, understanding where we all have gaps and we're all learning and being open to um, sharing that and leading out loud around it. Um, I have no doubt that our organizations and universities will, will prepare these kids technically for what the future holds. And it's, I like to say, you know, we've never moved this fast before. Things have never moved this fast before, but they'll also never move this slow again. Mm -hmm. And so I have no doubt that these kids will be prepared from that perspective. I think what they're not prepared for, though, is most walk into these organizations and feel like I can just work really hard and I'm going to get promoted mm -hmm. and I'm going to move up. And that's not how it works, right? We all know that. Like just being technically proficient is not what's gonna get you rewarded and recognized, but there's this notion around understanding relationship capital and how you relate well to, to others and how others relate to you. You know, so many of our young people now are so connected, as we all are, um, connected to those devices mm -hmm. and sort of go through their day with their head down like this and they like walk into like a glass door or something <laughs> like but it's this notion of relationship capital that I think is is really important and then the other part is just this influence capital It's really um, being able to connect with people in a way that people get excited and inspired by your ideas and so I would say if you can help these young people understand that part of it that the technical piece is not enough um, you certainly have to have empathy and all these other things that are I think critical and in, in, from a leadership perspective um, but understanding success will be measured by how well they, they manage and master all those other pieces, as well as the social impact piece. I mean, um, most of you probably read this stuff the Business Roundtable just did and where they released a statement saying that, you know, the number one job of a leader, CEO now, is not just about driving shareholder value. It's about improving society. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, Milton Friedman's probably rolling over in his grave, but... Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> But I think that's the future. That's the future of business, like communities. And we're all looking for business um, and businesses to lead um, in terms of solving many of the, the social um, issues that we are, um, we're wrestling with. Right. So we're really short on time, but I want to take one question from the audience. Do we have a brave volunteer sorry, with a really question? Oh, no, I love it. Your responses yeah. have been yeah. phenomenal. So thank you so much. Question over here. Thank you very much for bringing the mic over. Appreciate it. 
Hey, Greg. My name is uh, Matt Matthijs, fellow U.S. Bank employee. Thanks yeah. very much for sharing your experience here. This is great. Uh, you talked a little bit about kind of like the framework of accountability, some of the components maybe that can be scorecarded. But how do you evaluate, you know, what do you think about or how do you evaluate maybe markers for progress or that's being made or not being made, I guess? What are some of the other things that maybe you think about to how we evaluate progress? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Thanks for being here, by the way. And thanks for your question. Um, I think some of the other markers for progress, obviously, just like every other organization, you know, employee sentiment um, is a really important one for us. Um, and I promise you, this was not a setup. This is not a plan. <laughs> because what I'm going to say to Matt right now, diversity, equity, and inclusion is the number one employee favorability metric on our employee scorecard, um, our employee survey. Now, I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back, but it's true. <laughs> but what's important, though, is when you start to disaggregate that data, you understand that that's not true for everybody, that our African-American employees, our Hispanic employees, and in some regards, women um, actually see it very differently and that our scores aren't always that great. And so our um, employee survey is a really important um, metric that we use to measure progress. Um, we also look at exit surveys. Um, when people, when, um, people leave the organization, why are they leaving? Um, what are some of the reasons that they give? And so we look very closely um, at that data as well. And then you always have an opportunity, um, external recognition, and we apply for many surveys. We benchmark um, many companies, um, not only in our industry, but across um, industries, um, Diversity Inc. being one of them. And Diversity Inc. is an organization that measures, for the largest corporations in America, they actually put out a top 50 list every year. Um, and I promise this is not a U.S. Bank commercial, but when I took this job, our goal was actually to try to be on that list in about five years, so by the end of 2021. Well, we made it this year, um, so a year and a half ahead of schedule. And, but here's what's cool about that. I appreciate the clap. But what's cool about it is not that we made the list because we weren't driven by the list as much as it means we're doing a lot of the best practices and we're doing them really well on this journey. And there's a whole heightened level of, um, the final piece to your question is, there's a whole heightened um, um, level of accountability that's also being driven by Congress, quite frankly. So Maxine Waters, who chairs the Financial Services Committee in the House, um, created a subcommittee on diversity and inclusion. Um, well, they sent a letter to the top 40 banks in the country in June of this year. And only, and, and so what they were saying is there was a voluntary system for banks to actually report diversity and inclusion information to regulators. Um, it's all voluntary. And this happened three years ago. And when that happened, I went to our CEO, Andy, and said, Andy, I actually think we should submit our data. Um, even though we're not where we are, I think we should be really transparent and share the data. And so for the last three years, we've been submitting our information well, only about 3% of banks were actually doing that. So Maxine Waters said, okay, I'm tired of this. We're not asking anymore. Um, and so what was great, though, is we were able to say to her, and the, we've been doing this all along. And so we now have a relationship with her and her staff where it's a collaboration, where we can actually sit down and talk about solutions, and it's not a shame and blame session like she's done with other banks that you probably saw on C-SPAN. Um, and so, you know, I, we have lots of ways that we measure progress and some of them are internal, but there's also some external um, uh, sources and organizations that hold us accountable, which I think is great. And our industry certainly needs it, as you probably know. Thank you for that question. Um, I'm gonna ask one last question, yeah. and for the sake of time, I'm gonna ask that it's, in 10 words or less. So a sentence, I <laughs> which I know I, is gonna be really tough for Greg. I think I just got feedback, is that feedback? <laughs> no, it really is because I'm watching the clock. You got some so. feedback. <laughs> direct, you know, you just have to be direct and honest. Go ahead. Uh, and this is a question from one of the registrants uh, who are here today. What would you say, given the sort of you know, climate that we are in today, is your greatest opportunity, either within the bank, but also just externally to the bank uh, at this time? My personal? Yep. 
greatest opportunity? Yeah. I I think this I I just try to be I just try to be really brave and really authentic in the work that I do every day. Mm-hmm. How many words was that? That's perfect. <laughs> That's perfect. I had a lot more to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> leave it right there. Well, thank you so much for you. for your bravery. Thank you. Thank you. For your vulnerability. Um, And thank you for jumping in. Thank you for jumping in. Let's give Greg another round of applause. Well, thank you, Greg, and thank you for being that brave and authentic leader who is an inspiration to me and so many others in this room and so many in our community and our world today. So thank you. And a few other quick thanks. Um, I want to thank our platinum sponsor of our first Friday luncheon series, Minnesota Bank and Trust, our three gold sponsors, Stinson Electric, the St. Thomas Career Development Center, and the executive education programs in our Opus College of Business. And thank all of you for attending today. We look forward to seeing you at our next First Friday luncheon on November 1st, when we'll have the opportunity to hear from Ben Folk, Chairman and CEO of XL Energy. Have a great homecoming and family weekend and at St. Thomas or wherever you are. Go Tommies. Thank you.